Turn, if you would, to Luke chapter 14. Luke chapter 14. And I hope this morning that not only will you listen to the Word of God, but that you would meditate on it and consider it and how it applies to your life. I don't know that there is a more applicable portion of Luke's gospel to our day than the one we're about to read. It seems that the, Luke heats up some, and I kind of think at some point the mailman's going to get shot at because the mail keeps getting harder and harder. Uh, but keep in mind, I'm just the mailman. I didn't write the mail, I'm just delivering the mail. So, yes, it gets more intense, but when we get to this passage of Scripture, it really speaks, it should speak to us, especially in our Western, 21st century Western mindset, and especially in how we share the gospel, preach the gospel, call people to respond to the gospel. You see, in the name of love... In the name of love, we have reduced Christianity down to the lowest common denominator. In the name of love, we have tried to take this gospel message and make it easy. In the name of love, we've, we've tried to sweeten up the message of Jesus to make it more palatable because we want lost people to want Christ, we want lost people to want the gospel. We want lost people to come be a part of our church. So we, we ease it up. We ease the message of Jesus up. We dumb it down. We make it palatable. And what we've done, what we have done, people in America, this is why we have the problems we have in America. What we have done is we have created something that we call Christianity, that we pass off for Christianity, that we've sold as Christianity, that isn't Christianity at all. We have created something that we call Christianity that is not Christianity at all. Jesus. Jesus Christ, the author, the founder, the finisher of our faith, does not dumb down His call. He does not ease up on it. He doesn't attempt to make it more palatable. Jesus is brutally honest. He is brutally honest and forthright. And it's not because He does not care. It's not because He's arrogant. It's not because He's insensitive. But it is precisely because He is love. You see, the most loving thing to do is to give people the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, especially if their eternal souls depend upon it. And that's what Jesus does in Luke chapter 14, verses 25 to 35. He does the most loving thing. He tells the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth because their eternities depend upon it. The most unloving thing to do is to do what many preachers with good intentions have done over the past several decades. And it is to dumb down the truth, to ease up the truth, to sweeten the truth, to make it more palatable and therefore create a lie that lulls people to sleep in their insecurity And causes them to, to buy for themselves something that is not Christianity at all. The crowds in Luke chapter 14 need to know the truth. And Jesus loves them so much that He does not shrink back from telling them the truth and what His call to follow Him is really like. Luke chapter 14, beginning in verse 25, now large crowds... We're going along with him. Large crowds. We're going along with him. And he turned and said to them, 
If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not carry his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which one of you, when he wants to build a tower, does not first sit down and calculate the cost to see if he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he's laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who observe it begin to ridicule him, saying, this man began to build and was not able to finish. Verse 31, or what king... When he sets out to meet another king in battle, will not first sit down and consider whether he's strong enough with 10,000 men to encounter the one coming against him with 20,000. Or else, while the other is still far away, he sends a delegation and asks for terms of peace. So then none of you can be my disciple who does not give up all his own possessions. Therefore, salt is good, but if even salt has become tasteless, with what will it be seasoned? It's useless either for the soil or for the manure pile. It is thrown out. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. These teachings are without a doubt extreme if you heard them, especially in light of our backgrounds. But if the Bible is true, if the Bible is true, and if the Bible is trustworthy, the nature of Jesus' call is extreme. And what does this message teach us about the call to follow Jesus? I want us to see four things. First of all, I want us to see the comprehensive nature of the call. In verse number 25 and 26, it says, Now large crowds were going along with him. This is not just his twelve disciples. These are large crowds that are coming along with him. And he turned and said to them, he said to who? To the large crowds. He said to them, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father, mother, wife, children, brothers, sisters, and all his life, he cannot be my disciple. Do you see the comprehensive nature of this call? It's for everyone. You see, there are those today and in recent history who would preach, who would teach, who would say that the invitation of Jesus that Jesus extends here is not for everybody. It's it's not a comprehensive call. It's only for those closest to Him. See, the, the theory is that there are those, there's like two classes of Christians. There's those who, who hear the message, they believe the message, they receive the message, they pray, and, and then they go on with their normal life and they're good citizens. But then, on the other hand, there are those who really feel led to go deeper. They are, they're really interested in spiritual things. These are the ones, the ones who are really, really interested, who are really sold out. These are the ones that this kind of call is reserved for. It's not a call for all Christians. It's only for a certain class of Christians, for the, for the really committed Christian. And we may not say this out loud. You may not be willing to say this out loud. But is this not how most of us live? No, that's for the the super Christian. That's for the holier than holy Christian. I mean, we've got the normal Christians and we've got the sold out Christians. And the sold out Christians are the ones we try to convince they're, they're called to ministry. That makes us feel better. You know, they're sold out not because they're Christians, but because they they got some special calling on their life. They're supposed to be a preacher or missionary or something. Us normal Christians, we're just normal. And then people who take this seriously, Luke chapter 14 seriously, they must be preachers or something. But we know in in Luke chapter 14, the gospel call is a comprehensive call. It is for everyone. This is not a call to a deeper walk. Jesus is not turning around to the crowds and saying, here's a call for a deeper walk with me. This is not a call to a deeper walk. This is a call to a walk. It's a call to walk with Jesus. This is not a call for the special forces. This is a call He's extending to the crowds. And this is why it begins with, if anyone, if anyone would be my disciple. That doesn't leave anyone out. This is a comprehensive call. It's for me. It's for you. 
Not only is, do we see the comprehensive nature of the call, but we also see the conditional nature of this call. There's some conditions that Jesus puts upon this call. This is not an open-ended call to come as you choose to come. You cannot choose how to come to Jesus. Now, we've gotten some really smart people who've, who've sat together in rooms, and they've brainstormed, and they've come up with the easiest way to invite people to come to Jesus. The simplest way to invite people to Jesus. They've dumbed down the response to the lowest common denominator of how to respond to Jesus. And most likely, this is how all of us have been called or heard the call to come to Jesus. It goes something like this. If you're sitting in this room and you're not 100% certain that if you died right now, you would go to heaven, just slip up your hands. Every head's bowed, every eye's closed, just slip up your hand. If you've got 1% of 1% of 1% of doubt that if you were to die right now, you would go to heaven, just slip that hand up. I see that hand. Even if we don't see the hand, we say that we see the hand, so somebody else is more comfortable to raise their hand too. I see that hand. I see that hand. All right, now, if that's you, if you've raised your hand, here's what we want you to do. I want you to repeat this prayer after me in your heart of hearts. I'm not sure where the heart of hearts is, but it's somewhere in there. And I want you to repeat this prayer with me, and I want you to mean it in your heart of hearts. And you've got to be sincere. I mean, like, really sincere. Repeat it after me. Lord Jesus, if you, I believe in you. I believe you died for my sins. I believe you died on the cross. I believe you rose from the grave. Come into my life and save me. Now, if you prayed that prayer, if you prayed that prayer, you are a Christian. Don't let anybody ever cast doubt. Don't let anybody ever question whether or not you're a Christian or not. Because you prayed that prayer. In First Assumptions chapter 4, Jesus told the crowds, listen guys, if you want to go to heaven, repeat this prayer after me. And mean it in your heart of hearts. You know how easy it is to say a prayer? To repeat after the preacher? To raise your hand? And here's what we've done. We've taken multitudes of people who don't understand the gospel, who don't understand the gospel, which is the power of God for salvation. They don't understand the gospel. They don't understand what it means to follow Christ. And we've told them, repeat after me. And they repeat after us. And then we tell them, now you're a Christian. So they go out. At worst, they go out and they live like they've always lived. They do like they've always done. And when they die, the preacher stands over their casket and he says, I remember when old Billy Bob prayed this prayer after me and we know he's in heaven now. He lived like the devil. He racked up a tab with Satan, but you know, he's not. It, it's all good because he prayed that little prayer. And what's worse than that is Billy Bob goes out and he thinks he's a Christian because he repeated a prayer. That's the worst case scenario. Billy Bob goes out thinks he's a Christian because he prayed a prayer. Billy Bob's buddies think he's a Christian because he said he prayed a prayer. Billy Bob, everybody that attends Billy Bob's funeral all of a sudden feels better about the prayer they prayed even though they're living like the devil like Billy Bob. Everybody goes out happy because the preacher said so. Does his thing over them. That's worst case scenario. Best case scenario. Best case scenario is they sit in the pew every Sunday, sing the songs, open their Bibles, Go to Sunday school. Listen to the sermons. The Holy Spirit speaks to them week after week. You really haven't been transformed. You really haven't been born again. You really haven't been made a new creation. But they keep going back to that time. I remember that time when I repeated that prayer perfectly. And the preacher said I was okay and he gave me a certificate. And he baptized me. So I'm going to hang on to that rather than the truth. Now, I know I'm meddling. I'm meddling. I, look, I grew up Southern Baptist. I, I grew up in the church that did the same exact thing. But the most unloving thing for me to do is to pretend like that equals Jesus' call to follow Him. That's the most unloving thing for me to do. The most loving thing for me to do is say, here is what Jesus, who holds your soul in His hand, says about you. 
We can dumb it down. We can ease it up. We can make it simple. We, I mean, we can even come down to, to kumbaya. Just throw your pine cone in the fire. Y'all know that really happens? That really happened to camp. Just, just throw your pine cone in the fire if you want to go to heaven. And if you really want to receive Jesus, just throw your pine cone in the fire. We can dumb it down till we can all bring a pine cone next Sunday and just throw your pine cone out there. You see how silly that is? You know why it's silly? Because it's not in the Bible. It's just as silly as saying, repeat this magic formula after me. Same silliness. And we need to recognize it. We need to recognize the silliness of taking the comprehensive, conditional call of Jesus and Americanizing it to the point where it's not even Christianity anymore. And filling our churches with people who have signed off on this type of response when no work has been done in their life. And then they cause trouble for the rest of their existence. They cause trouble because they don't love Christ. They just signed up and they're on the membership roll. What does a real call to follow Jesus look like? It, you have to meet His conditions. He gives us three in this passage of Scripture. Three conditions that He lays down. Three times He says, if you do not meet these conditions, now hear the words, if you do not meet these conditions, you cannot be My disciple. We need to think about this. The first one is your relationships. So Jesus doesn't turn to the crowds and say, if anyone wants to be My disciple, repeat this prayer after Me. He turns to the, the crowds and He says, if anyone wants to be My disciple... You have to consider your relationships. Verse 26, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. I didn't write that. I just read it. Jesus said it. Jesus Christ said it. And what he's communicating here is not, I hate my mom, I hate my dad. That would be really easy for a lot of teenagers, wouldn't it? What he's communicating here is not a hatred for your parents and a hatred for your family, but a love for Jesus that surpasses your love for your family. In Matthew 10, 37, he said it this way, Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me, and whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. What he's saying is, all of your relationships are now subordinated if you're going to be my disciple. What honors me, what pleases me, what I desire, what I will, what I command as the Lord of your life trumps every other demand of every other relationship you have. I am in control. Now what's interesting here is what we often miss. It's what pleases God, what pleases Christ is for children to obey their parents in everything. For this pleases the Lord, Colossians 3.20. Honor your father and your mother, Exodus 20.12. What pleases Him is for wives to submit to their own husbands as to the Lord, and for husbands to love their wives as Christ loved the church and gave Himself up for. What pleases Him is for husbands to hold fast to, to cling to their wives. See, if we put Jesus first... The normal pattern, the normal pattern for most of us is if we put Jesus first, He will subordinate our relationships, but in doing so, He will cause those relationships to deepen, not diminish. Are you with me? So we subordinate every relationship to Christ, and when we do that, those relationships generally, normally, especially in our context, don't diminish, they deepen. We understand the, the, the significance of obeying our parents and honoring our parents like never before. We understand the importance of loving our wives and submitting to our husbands and clinging to one another like never before. We understand the importance of honoring our father and mother and raising our children in the fear and admonition of the Lord like never before. When we come to Christ, our relationships don't diminish, they deepen most of the time. Now let me just let me just say some some of you. The easiest thing for you to be, the easiest thing for you to do, would be to say, "Forget you, mama. Forget you, daddy. Forget you, brother. Forget you, sister. Forget you, kid. I'm gonna run for Jesus." And let me just say, if that's easy for you, 
then most likely Jesus is calling you to turn around and fight for your relationship with your husband or your wife or your parents or your children or your brothers or your sisters. You with me? If it's easy for you to reject your family relationships, then it may be that Jesus' call for you and command to you is to deepen those relationships through the power of the gospel working in your life. There are other situations in which you cannot follow Jesus and be obedient to your parents. You cannot follow Jesus and live in harmony with your brothers, your sisters, or even your children. And as in those times, you have to follow Jesus. Condition of your relationships. The second condition is found in verse 27. It's the condition of your life. Verse 27 says, Whoever does not carry his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Now when we hear that, we think of a piece of jewelry, we think of a backache, we think of an ornery mother-in-law, we think of anything but what Jesus was really talking about. When Jesus looked at the crowds and He said, you're going you're gonna to follow me, and if you're going to follow me, it's going to cost you a cross. His original audience knew exactly what He was calling for. Perhaps some 30,000 people were crucified in the lifetime of Jesus alone. Rome made a habit of crucifying people. And the disciples knew exactly what to expect when Jesus said, take up your cross, and it was not good. They immediately pictured a poor, condemned soul walking along the road, carrying his cross, carrying his instrument of execution on his back. And one thing they knew was true about that man. If he was seen leaving town carrying a cross, he was never coming back. He was as good as dead. So Jesus is saying, what you have to be willing to embrace and endure, if you follow me, is a cross. You must willingly and intentionally take up your life. In Luke chapter 9 and verse 23, he had already said, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. A.W. Tozer said there were three things that would be true about the person who was crucified. One, a person on a cross would be facing only one direction. So when Jesus says, take up your cross... You get on the cross, and some of, you, some of you have come to the cross, and come to the cross, and come to the cross, and knelt at the cross, and sung about the cross, and it's, and it's time for you to, to get on the cross. We just read Galatians. I am crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but He who lives in me. It's time to stop just coming to the cross, coming to the cross, every revival, every conference, every Sunday, come to the cross, and get up on the cross, and be crucified with Christ, and put yourself to death. When you get on that cross, you only look one way. One way. You're not, you're not confused about which way you're looking. You're not two-faced. You're not looking in two directions. You're looking one direction. A person on a cross would be facing only one direction. He said a person on a cross could never turn back. There's no getting off once you're on. And a person on a cross would no longer have any plans of his own. He's not thinking about tomorrow, planning for tomorrow. He's dead to himself. The condition of our life. Now if you skip down to verse 33, you see that there's another condition. The condition of our riches. The condition of our riches. In verse 33 says, So then none of you can be my disciple who does not give up all his own possessions. Along with willingness to place him above family and life, Jesus also calls his followers to surrender their possessions to his lordship. Now, some of us are getting a little uncomfortable, aren't we? Well, you know, life, probably not going to really die. Parents, you know, they already know I'm a Christian. Don't mess with my stuff. I'm an American. I worked hard for my stuff. I worked hard 40 years so I could retire and tour the globe. I mean, this is my life. My rights. Don't mess with my stuff. I'm not messing with your stuff. Jesus is messing with your stuff. And that Greek word there for give up, the Greek word literally means to say goodbye to. You think about this. Jesus turns around this crowd and He says, listen guys, you want to be my disciple? You got to be willing to reject your family, your relationships. Guys, you want to be my disciple? You got to be willing to go to the cross. Guys, you want to be my disciple? Say goodbye to everything you have. 
That's a bit different than Joel Osteen's message, I will say. It's a bit different than anybody on TBN's message. INSP, they start all those guys. I mean, they sound, that feels good. This doesn't feel too good. We must be willing to give up our finances, our stuff, to follow Christ. Peter, Andrew, James, John, they all got out of their boat, left their nets. They left their business. Matthew gets up and leaves a high-paying position as a tax collector. Zacchaeus paid back all that he had stolen and he gave up half of his goods to the poor. Christ will subordinate your riches. And if he hasn't, you need to examine yourself because there was one guy who came to Jesus and said, I've kept all the commandments from my youth up, Jesus. I've done it all. And Jesus said, then sell all you have. Give to the poor. Come follow me. And he said, could you repeat that? And he went away sorrowful. Jesus is looking at us this morning and it is a clearly conditional call. He says, you cannot be my disciple. You cannot be my disciple. You cannot be my disciple. Now, does Jesus tell the truth or does Jesus cloud the truth? Does Jesus tell the truth or does Jesus cloud the truth? It would be a good time for you to answer the correct way. We know the right answer, right? Does Jesus tell the truth? Yes. Does He cloud the truth? He says, you cannot be my disciple. You cannot be my disciple. You cannot be my disciple. And here's what he's saying. If your family is going to reject you and hate you and become your enemies because you follow me, will you still follow me? If you have plans and you have ambitions and the commands or the call of Christ requires something different, are you, are you ready to lay down your plans and your ambitions? Are you ready to lay down everything? If I ask you to take everything you have, sell it, and give it to the poor, would you be willing to do that? Well, he would never ask us to do that. You know, that was a specific situation for a specific rich guy. He doesn't do that for everybody. He doesn't do it for everybody, but he does it for some people. It's interesting that the only person in all of history Jesus is asked to give up everything to follow him is this rich young ruler guy. The rest of us, you know, he knows my heart. Are you willing? Here's the question. Here's the the overall question we have to ask ourselves this morning. Are you willing to become a steward of everything and an owner of nothing? Are you willing to become a steward of everything and an owner of nothing? Because when you come to Jesus, you own nothing. Nothing. When you come to Jesus, you have no rights. Doesn't matter what country you're from. When you come to Jesus, you become an owner of nothing and a steward of everything. Is Christ worth everything to you? Paul said in Philippians chapter 3, verse 8, I count all things lost. For the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them as rubbish, that I may gain Christ. I won't give you the literal Greek word of that rubbish. You go look that up on your own. It's not very nice. But it conveys this thought. I count it all scubula. That's the word. That I may Gain Christ. Thirdly, the costly nature of the call. I've got to get moving. The costly nature of the call. Conditions are so great for one to follow Christ and answer the call. And one must consider carefully the cost of this call. Jesus doesn't turn around the crowds and say, you can't be my disciple, you can't be my disciple, you can't be my disciple. Sign on the line right now. Your soul is at stake. Quick, quick, quick. Hell's hot. Quick, sign the line. He doesn't doesn't insist on a hasty emotional decision. 
Instead, he urges those who have followed him to think seriously, to count the cost. He doesn't work them up with an emotional tune. We're going to sing 47 verses of this song. We're going to play it soft. We're going to play it loud. We're going to, we're going to do whatever we... I'll tell a sad story at the end of the sermon. Sad story. To draw out those emotions. He doesn't do any of that. He doesn't want you to promise to follow Jesus unless you understand the cost and unless you're willing to pay the cost. The ramifications are great. He uses two illustrations to drive home the importance of a serious deliber deliberation over this call. The first story he tells, the first illustration he uses is about buildings in verses 30, 28 to 30. Listen to this story about buildings. He says, For which if one of you, when he wants to build a tower, does not first sit down and calculate the cost to see if he has enough to complete it. Otherwise, when he's laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who observe it begin to ridicule him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. What Jesus is saying is, don't start building unless you can finish what you start. Sit down and think about the cost of following me. John Stott writes in Basic Christianity, the Christian landscape is strewn with the wreckage of derelict, half-built towers, the ruins of those who began to build and were unable to finish. For thousands of people still ignore Christ's warnings and undertake to follow Him without first pausing to reflect on the cost of doing so. Large numbers of people have covered themselves with a thin veneer of Christianity. Not only does he tell the story of buildings, but he tells the story of battles in verses 31 to 32. What king, when he sets out to meet another king in battle, will not first sit down and consider whether he is strong enough with 10,000 men to encounter the one coming against him with 20,000? Or else, while the other is still far away, he sends a delegation and asks for terms of peace. What man, what king, what leader is going to put his army in danger before he sits down and assesses the, his chances of winning the battle? And if he comes up to the conclusion that he can't win, verse 32 says he's going to send a delegation and ask for peace. There's no sense in spilling a lot of blood to get to the same end that would come by negotiating. Now we may not see it at first glance here when we look at these two illustrations of buildings and battles, but what Jesus just did was he, he squished everybody in the crowd in between a rock and a hard place. And by default, he's, he's squeezing all of us here this morning, in between a rock and a hard place. You see, in the first parable, Jesus says, sit down and decide whether you can afford to follow me. Determine the cost of the building before breaking ground. In the second parable, He says, sit down and decide whether you can afford not to follow me. Because you see, there's a king, and his army is coming soon. Can you stand against him? See, we're, we're, we're put in a position where we have to say, wow, the cost of following Jesus is high. Can I afford to build this tower? But then we look to the left and we realize, but there's a king whose army is coming soon to hold me accountable, to judge me in righteousness and in wisdom. Can I afford not to follow Him? Can I stand up against this King? Can I resist this King? Do I have a chance against this King? Or do I need to negotiate peace? Yes, it's costly, but I need peace. Count the cost. Jesus does not want disciples who do not realize what they've signed up for. Because Jesus is not offering us a makeover to make your life better, to make your life more beautiful. Jesus is offering you a takeover. Christianity is not a makeover, it's a takeover. When you come to Jesus, He says, you're not adding me to your life. I become your life. I become your life. The call is costly. Lastly, quickly, the continual nature of the call in verses 34 and 35. Salt is good, but even if salt has become tasteless, with what will it be seasoned? It's useless either for the soil or the manure pile. It's thrown out. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. He implies the continual nature of the call. The saltiness must 
remain. This is not a call you, you answer on June 7th, 2009, never to be concerned about again. This is a call that demands persistence. This is a call that demands a present tense face. faith. This is a call that is continual in nature. If the salt loses its saltiness, what good is that salt? It will be thrown out. If we lose our temperature, we will be spewed out. Revelation 3, 15 to 16. I know your works. You're neither cold nor hot. What would, would that you were either cold or hot. So because you were lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my Mouth. We're not talking about Christians who lose their salvation. We're talking about people who sign up for something that's not Christianity. Half-hearted disciples. They become half-hearted disciples. They pray the prayer. They sign the card. They get baptized. They don't understand the gospel. They don't count the cost. They don't really intend to follow Jesus. They sign the card and they become half-hearted disciples. And half-hearted disciples do more damage than good. Do you hear me? Half-hearted disciples do more damage than good. And that's why the past year and the coming four at least are good. Because we're, we're going through a sifting. We're going through a sifting. And half-hearted disciples aren't going to last very long. Luke 9.62 says, No one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. It's daily repentance, daily belief, daily dying to yourself. It's continual. Paul didn't just say, I am crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives within me. He also said, I die daily. You know, we jump on that cross, and the first thing we want to do is resurrect every morning when we get out of bed, right? Well, flesh wants to resurrect. And you know what we have to do? We've got to go back to the cross and get back on it. It's continual. Continual repentance. Continual faith. Continual walking with Christ. Continual fighting for first place in our life. It's a comprehensive call. It's for everybody in this room. It is a con conditional call. You can't be my disciple. You can't be my disciple. You can't be my disciple. If your relationships, your life, and your stuff is not subordinated to Christ. This is a costly call. Can you afford to follow Jesus? Can you afford not to follow Jesus? And that's a continual call. Jesus does not dumb down the truth here. He doesn't ease up the cost for us. He doesn't make the difficulty more palatable to get us to sign on the dotted line. He tells the truth. He does the most loving thing He can do. He tells us the truth about how to have eternal life. And I've tried to tell you the truth. But here's one more, real quick. As we think about the cost and the cost and the cost, here's one more. Jesus is... Worth it. Jesus is worth it. John Calvin said this, I gave up all for Christ. And what have I found? I gave up all for Christ. And what have I found? Everything in Christ. I gave up all to follow Christ. And what have I found? Everything. Everything in Christ. This is not a cost. This is not a cost. This is not a sacrifice. This is an investment that guarantees returns. You turn away from sin, which leads to death and destruction, and you turn to Christ, which leads to life. And not just life, but abundant life. Do you have it? Jesus Christ came to this earth to check every box required. He went to the cross to pay for every sin you've committed. He rose from the grave so that if you this morning will count the cost and turn away from your life of sin and your life of idolatry and put your faith and your trust in Him alone, He will make you right with God and give you Life, life abundant, and peace.
That's the call of Christ. Have you responded to it? Would you bow with me? Miss Lisa's going to come play soft. As you bow, I want you to just allow the Holy Spirit to search your heart. Bow your heads, close your eyes. Allow the Holy Spirit to search your heart. And here's what I want you to pray. I want you to ask the Lord, have I just gone through some motions? Have I just gone through some Southern Baptist motions? Got my name on the membership roll. Or have I really, really been made a new creation? I'm not saying made perfect. I'm not saying you don't wrestle with your relationships or your life or your stuff. But has your heart been transformed? Have you had a heart transplant? Ask the Holy Spirit to show you where you stand with Him this morning. How you've responded to Him this morning. Have you just checked man-made boxes? Or have you truly surrendered? Surrendered all to Jesus Christ? Ask the Holy Spirit to show you that. To give you assurance or to wreck your life right now, one of the two. Wreck your heart right now. Give me assurance or wreck my heart, Lord. If God has shown you that you've not truly been transformed, you've not truly been made a new creation, the Bible makes it clear. Turn from your sin. Put your trust and your faith in the finished work of Christ on the cross. Confess Him as your Lord. Believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead. Call upon His name. You can do that right now. You don't have to walk down here and have a preacher pray for you. You can do that right now where you're sitting. You can call upon the name of the Lord. You can turn from your sin. You can put your faith and trust in Him. And the Holy Spirit will grant you repentance. He can grant you faith. He can transform your life. Would you call out to Him? If you have that assurance, would you pray for those around you? That they would find peace with God? That they would find true relationship with Him? That's revival. That's awakening. That happens. That's how a movement of God starts when we come to Him. In submissive humility, surrendering all to Him. When we get up on that cross. Let me pray for you. Father, we thank You for Your love, Your grace, Your mercy. We thank You for loving us enough to tell us the truth about what it means to follow You. And while Christianity has been a segue to success in this country... For so long, God, you are reminding us that around the world, Christianity is not a segue to success, but it's a segue to poverty, to suffering, to persecution, to being disliked, hated for your name's sake. As we see the tenor of our culture change, almost daily it seems, you're reminding us of the cost of following you. I pray. God, I pray for those people, that person in this room who knows deep down in their heart that they've just checked off some man-made boxes, but they have never been transformed by the power of Your Gospel. I pray that You would grant them repentance, that You would grant them faith even now, that You would move them to call upon Your name.
And that they would not leave this place without telling someone, without confiding in someone, without grabbing someone who can point them to You, pray with them and encourage them as they seek You. Help us, Lord. Speak to us. Move in spite of me, in spite of my weakness. Speak what You want to be heard. and Help us to respond to Your still, small voice. In Jesus' name.